right now I'm trying to start the, I'm not sure what is going on. Um, okay, start over. <laughs> Okay, is it working now? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, thank you, Dan, for um, the introduction. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, this is my first uh, online seminar or webinar, so um, I hope I will be clear and I should have enough time for a question at the end. So you, if anything is not quite clear, just ask me at the end. Um, so uh, this um, project that I'm going to present today is, um, is was, um, I started it when I was doing my PhD uh, at the Natural History Museum in Paris. Um, and then I moved on to a, a bit of a different topic in the US during my postdoc, but I continued working uh, on on this um, on this topic during my uh, first and second postdoc uh, in collaboration with us, um, um, some people in Australia. So uh, I want to start by thanking um, all my collaborators on on this project, which are quite many. Um, so first, the funding agencies, um, as well as my um, PhD advisors, Jérôme Sueur and Fanny Rivac. Um, my collaborators from Australia, Simon Link and Toby Gifford. Um, and also um, Diego Yusia, who is my current advisor. Um, and finally, all the students that have helped the project and been involved in fieldwork and analysis. Um, so the talk of today is going to be um, a general introduction uh, about um, ecoacoustics, then a bit about how to monitor freshwater environments. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about some um, examples of um, uh, case studies that I've been involved with. And finally, we'll look at some of the perspectives for the, um, for the future of uh, freshwater ecoacoustics. Um, so, um, when you arrive to a new environment, such as a uh, tropical forest, uh, you might not be able to detect right away which are the, the species around you, um, if you only rely on your, um, on your sight. Um, however, if you listen uh, carefully, you might detect some, um, some different species. Um, so here you see those, um, those patterns, and I, I think all of you are familiar with um, a spectrogram, but it's a representation of the frequency in function of the time. And you also have the amplitude in function of the time, so the wave, waveform. And you can see all those um, uh, patterns, and those patterns uh, correspond to the sounds of um, different animals. So using acoustics, um, it is possible to detect uh, the presence of different species, to detect their, um, their identity, um, also to uh, locate them within the environment and to, um, to have information about their uh, ecology, uh, their behavioral status. Are they looking for food? Are they looking for a mate? Uh, are they um, um, uh, telling the world about their territory? So all this information that you can uh, take out of sounds is the, the main uh, goal of um, uh, an emerging discipline uh, that is called ecoacoustics. Um, so it's using the sounds to have information about the ecology. Um, and so um, there are different uh, study scales for ecoacoustics. The, the first scale is the acoustic population. So it's made of um, uh, a monospecific um, group of sounds. Um, and so in the environment, most of the time, you will have several acoustic populations. 
and those, popu uh, those acoustic populations will make up the acoustic community. Um, and also in an environment, usually you don't only have um, the, the sounds of animals, but also the sounds of um, other um, processes such as um, rain or uh, wind. And all of that taken together makes up the uh, soundscape. So this discipline was devo developed initially mostly in, uh, in terrestrial environments. And we know um, from our, through our experience that we have a world of sound around us. But what about freshwater environments? So ponds, rivers, lakes, um, is there any sound underwater? Um, and of course, when you look at a, a picture like this, um, it's the same as a tropical forest. You don't see anything. You don't see any um, individual uh, right away. However, you can um, um, listen to them. So. Um, could you hear that? Uh, properly. I'm not sure if the, the sound is uh, properly shared or not. Um, okay. Yeah so. yeah, so we could hear that, no problem. Okay, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so here is what, uh, what they look like. Um, so you have um, a lot of different uh, sound patterns. And so uh, now I'm going to tell you about uh, a bit more about how to monitor freshwater environments and also what we can monitor in, in freshwater environments. Um, so that's the this second section. So um, first, uh, what traditionally when uh, when recording uh, when monitoring a, fr a freshwater environment, what people will do is um, take net samples. So they will go on with, with the net and um, sample macroinvertebrates, sample fishes. Um, but the problem is these, these techniques are invasive. They only provide a point in time. Um, they can be quite um, labor in intensive. So, so, um, so of course, um, uh, acoustics can be a, an interesting um, method for monitoring. And so to monitor um, the tools that uh, we've been using for ecoacoustics are autonomous recordings and hydrophones. So the hydrophones, um, we've been using uh, similar hydrophones to the ones um, that are used for marine mammal monitoring. Um, and then the recorders, um, because usually we're working on um, rather small um, sites or um, ponds, we have the chance to be able to uh, to leave the the recorders the recorders on on the shore, um, and so we're using those autonomous recorders that are weatherproof um, that can we can set up a um, a schedule to to record continuously. And that gives us um, an, a very nice uh, overview of what the, the soundscape is in, in those environments. Um, and so what can we hear uh, underwater and freshwater? So the first thing um, is, of course, animals. So um, during my PhD, I did a literature review of um, which species produce sounds underwater. Um, and um, of course, this would be perfect to expand to the world, but um, France is already quite a bit of, um, of work. And so um, we found that uh, the spe 271 species are soniferous in freshwater in France. Um, and among them, we have uh, four groups, um, amphibians, crustaceans, fishes, and insects. And you can see clearly the majority of sound producers are insects. So we expect to hear a lot more insects than other species in, uh, in freshwater. Um, another source of, um, of sound is plants. 
um, plants when uh, uh, doing photosynthesis produce sounds and here is what um, it sounds like. And I also have a video to convince you of uh, what it can look like because it's quite impressive. So this is a video that um, an artist uh, shared with me uh, and he recorded it in France. So I'm not sure I need to share my screen for this one, I think. Um, here. There we go. Okay. So you see the, the hydrophone and then you have the, the leaf and you have a little, little bubbles coming out of the leaf. And then the, my, my friend Francois Vaillon is going to uh, remove the bubbles from the, the leaf. Right here. And you see a little bubble forming uh, on the leaf. Okay, so so plants produce sounds too, um, which is quite impressive because um, we didn't expect it. But basically, it's when the 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 oxygen is coming out of the leaf and um, uh, it's going through the stomata, and so the um, the the bubble that is forming is producing these um, these sounds. Um, and I think we're where it's quite a new uh, um, recent discovery. So we're, st we're still thinking about how to use that maybe to, um, to monitor environments. Um, the, the next is ge geological sounds. Um, so when um, in rivers, especially when you have flow turbulence or um, sediment transport that uh, produces a lot of sound, and those sounds can be used to classify environments. So this is the work of Diego uh, Tonola and his colleagues who um, managed to classify five um, river reaches um, according to the, the amplitude, the, the, the energy content of um, different frequency bands. Um, so you can also use geological sounds as, um, or this, the sound made by flow turbulence and sediment transport to monitor environments. Um, and finally, of course, the human made uh, uh, noise. So we, we know it quite well. It's um, um, a subject that's quite uh, well studied right now for, uh, for marine environments, but um, freshwater environments also have sounds, uh, also have uh, noises. Um, especially the, for example, lakes that are recreational or, um, or ponds and rivers that are close to a road. Um, and so Marta Bogan was, I think, one of the first to study this, um, this subject and found that um, in a recreational um, lake, the, the noise could reach levels of 150 dBs, which is really loud. Um, so it's, it would be interesting to um, map a bit better what the noise are um, and where they are and also how it affects freshwater animals. Um, so now that we know that we can um, monitor uh, quite a lot of uh, using freshwater acu uh, passive acoustics, um, I'm going to talk to you about um, what we can do uh, um, with that. So the first um, case study is about uh, community structure and how um, acoustic communities are, are um, structured by, by an environmental variable. So, um, so we know that um, 
in, in ecology, it's quite clear that species are usually deter uh, determined by environmental variables. So if a species likes uh, cold climates, you won't find it in hot climates. Um, and so we're, we're wondering if we can find such a link with acoustic communities and key environmental variables. Um, and also, we know that in freshwater environments, as I showed you before, most of the emitters are insects, so part of the macroinvertebrates. So we wanted to know whether there is a relationship between acoustic communities and macroinvertebrate communities. Um, and indeed, macroinvertebrates are usually used um, as bi uh, in bioassessments as indicators of, of, um, of ecological quality, etc. So, um, so macroinvertebrates, um, if there is a relationship between the two, it would be very interesting for, um, for using acoustics as a monitoring tool. Um, so we studied um, secondary channels in the upper Rhone. So the Rhone is a river in France. This is France. Um, and so we, we selected those environments um, based on a lateral connectivity gradients. So you have the secondary channels on the side like this, and you have the main river. And they are, um, they vary in lateral connectivity. So that um, some secondary channels will be very co completely connected to the main river. Some will be only connected in the lower part of the, so the downhill of the secondary channel, and some will be completely disconnected. And even within the disconnected ones, you have variation. Um, some sites will be, uh, <clears throat> will be reconnected right, uh, right away when there is a flood, and some will only be reconnected when there is a flood that is very big. So basically every 10 years, every 100 years. So we have all this um, lateral connectivity gradient. So we chose six sites that were along this gradient. Um, you have here the lowest connectivity and on the other side, the highest. Um, if you look at those two sites, um, you have a lot of vegetation, a lot of dead wood in the, high, the low connectivity environment, whereas the high connectivity environment has a lot of open water. And that is because the flow that is coming from the river, um, when, when there is no connection, uh, when there is a connection, is going to, um, to scrape off the vegetation and the, the dead wood the sediments. Um, we also looked at another environmental variable, which is temperature. Uh, so we know that a lot of uh, animals are producing sound um, only in certain conditions. They also, as I was saying before, some um, only ex um, live in certain temperature conditions. So we looked at two aspects of temperature. First, we looked at the, the average temperature. And then we looked at the daily deviation from this average. So basically it's going to be, it's like um, warm anomalies and cold anomalies compared to the average temperature. Um, so behind that was the idea that maybe if it's hot, it's a hot day, they're going to be more active or less active or some species will be more active and some other less active uh, acoustically. Um, and so we went to record um, for about for three weeks in 2014, one minute every hour, um, and we recorded um, a bit more than 4,000 files and uh, analyzed about a thousand. Um, the analysis was made manually. Um, we annotated each sound type found in the in the environment. Um, and then we, we ended up with the sound type composition of the acoustic community. Um, 
We also had access to the macroinvertebrates, uh, thanks to the, my colleagues at the University of Geneva, who have been working on this, uh, these uh, sites for about over 30 years. So, um, so they took samples um, as part of their yearly monitoring scheme. Um, so we had access to the composition of um, the macroinvertebrate communities as well. Um, to analyze the data, we did uh, multivariate analysis and we looked at the relationship with environmental variables with, uh, with linear, linear models. So the first um, graph I'm showing you is, the, is a multivariate analysis, so it's a between uh, correspondence analysis. I can tell you more about it if you, if you like later, but it's basically um, another type of PCA. Um, so what we see when we look at the, each, um, each ellipse is a, is, a, is a site and each of the points is one day, the composition, the acoustic composition of one day. Um, and each, um, if you have two points that are close together on the graph, that means that they have very close um, um, composition, so they have similar compositions. And you have si uh, sites that are, or points that are far away, that means that their composition is uh, more distinct. Um, and so what we see here, and what we've tested uh, statistically, is that um, the, the acoustic composition of each site is more, um, is, uh, more convergent than expected by chance, basically the um, the sound the 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 they have each site has a specific acoustic community um and then if you if we now look at the relationship with um acoustic um with um, with connectivity lateral connectivity so we're taking the first axis of this uh, of this graph we find a relationship between lateral connectivity and this uh, multivariate axis. So there is a progressive change of, um, of um, composition, of sound type composition um, with lateral connectivity. So now probably you have noticed this, uh, this site. And actually this site is, um, is a site that has been restored um, recently. And, uh, and my colleagues um, at the University of Geneva told me that it's, it's a site that's still um, um, adapting or changing to, uh, in response to, the, to, those, um, to this restoration. So it's a site that is extremely diverse um, and very different from all, all the other sites in the, um, in the study. So, um, we, did, we ran the analysis using um, with and without this site, and we find that we have a relationship with connectivity with, when we remove this site. Um, so here's the relationship. And so now if we look at macroinvertebrates, um, so this is the same graph, but with uh, macroinvertebrate community, uh, communities. And we find exactly the same pattern. We have this site that is completely different and uh, quite a nice relationship uh, with lateral connectivity for the other um, sites. So clearly, oops. Excuse me, I'm not sure what. Um, I'm not sure what is was it coming out blank with for you too because uh... yeah there was a black or a blank white screen there okay it's it's not supposed to be blank I'm not sure what's going on sorry I'm going to check um, no because there are it's um, let me start my PDF reader again because <laughs> I'm not sure what happened there. Sorry. Okay, 
while you're doing that, I'll just remind people if you're viewing with multiple people, just send me a chat as uh, when you can and let me know how many people so we can keep track. I can tell you right now there's eight viewing here at UNH. Okay. Okay, I think we're back. Um, let me share my screen again. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, okay. We can see it that way. Um, can you see it now? Uh, we can see it in the PDF software. It's not full screen. Oh, now it's not showing, right? Um, okay, I think. Here now, there you go. now you're full screen. Great. And then now it comes, uh, it doesn't come back. So excuse me for that. Um, so, so it, yeah, so we find um, exactly the, or a very similar relationship um, between uh, macroinvertebrate communities and lateral connectivity. Um, and indeed, if we look at the relationship between um, the acoustic community composition and the macroinvertebrate community composition, we, with that, we find uh, quite a nice relationship as well. Um, so in summary, we find that we have distinct acoustic communities um, in distinct channels. Um, we have a relationship between acoustic communities and lateral connectivity, and also a relationship between macroinvertebrates and acoustic communities that are both similarly related to connectivity. Um, so we've, we've seen um, now uh, uh, the relationship between, uh, with, uh, with community um, and how, can, how we can use ecoacoustics to study um, the community structure. Um, what about if we scale, scale it down a bit and look at population dynamics? Um, so um, what, what we know is that most uh, species have specific activity dynamics. For example, birds um, will, will um, sing at specific times, um, usually the dawn and dusk chorus. Um, and so we wonder whether there is similar dynamics for uh, an aquatic insect. Um, and then we know that anthropogenic noise is a growing threat for various environments and that in many environments it also um, cha can change the activity dynamics of the population. For example, um, it's well known that many um, birds in urban areas are starting to sing uh, earlier than birds in um, more uh, wild environments. So we want to know what is the effect of noise on such aquatic dynamics. Um, so we looked at uh, Micronecta chelsea, which is uh, an aquatic um, bug, uh, Heteroptera. It's about 2.3 millimeters, but it produces sounds that can uh, reach 105 dB SDL. Um, and they're, they have been recognized as um, uh, in the Guinness World Record as the loudest penis because they produce sounds with their genitalia. Um, and they're actually the loudest animal on earth compared to their size. So they're a very good candidate for um, acoustic monitoring. Um, and so we monitored a pond in the south of France um, that is um, about uh, 20 meters wide. Um, and we did, we used um, a grid of recorders to have access to the spatial and temporal um, variation within, um, within the pond. Um, but today I'm mostly going to talk about the temporal patterns observed. 
Um, we recorded for three weeks in June 2015 um, using uh, this setup. Um, so we had um, the, the pond depth is about a meter. So we, uh, to have homogeneous um, acoustic co conditions, we uh, set up the the, the hydrophones to be 25 centimeters from the from the bottom of the pond and so we recorded for one minute every 15 minutes um, and we recorded a total of 20,000 files so that was a bit too much to analyze by hand uh, or manually so we used um, an activity um, te a, a technique to monitor the activity um, so um, we based this um, um, activity detection on the sound of the species. So here is what it sounds like in, um, in the lab when it's only one individual. And here is what it sounds like in the field. So you probably um, uh, noticed that there are two main differences um, between the, um, the laboratory and the field version. The first one is that instead of having clear temporal patterns for the, the call, you end up with a wide uh, frequency band that's um, almost continuous. So you lose the temporal, um, the temporal resolution. And also, there are other species singing at the same time. So we focused on the frequency and we used the frequency band of the species to detect what um, the, the amplitude of uh, the, the amount of activity that was there in the recordings. And luckily, there is no other species that produces sound um, in this pond in this uh, frequency band. So we were able to use this frequency band. <clears throat> so we used the, the, the amplitude of um, between 7 and 12 kilohertz. Um, and to test that, uh, to verify that this um, this activity score was um, was effective was working, we listened to three hundred recordings um, and classified them um, as absence, uh, less than ten signals, um, more than ten signals, but signals that can still be detected in terms of um, temporal patterns and fully continuous band. Um, band uh, uh, frequency band and and so we find quite a clear relationship between the listening score and our activity score um, so now we looked at the um, we look at the dynamics in response to the noise uh, and this noise was emitted on one side of the pond um, and we could we could control the, the, the emission of this noise. Um, so we decided to um, do a, an experiment uh, with a first week of experiment without any sound to uh, be able to detect and um, study the, the di diurnal activity patterns of the species. Um, without any disturbance. We then played back the noise for two hours um, just before the peak of activity. Uh, and then we, we had a post-treatment uh, week where we looked at whether the, the activity was going down uh, after the, the noise or was uh, changing um, in any ways. Um, so first, here is what the acoustic activity uh, per day looks like. So you have here the acoustic activity in function of the time. Each, um, so the gray areas are the night time. So each combination of a white and a gray is 24 hours. 
Um, you can notice as well probably those um, dashed lines which correspond to the um, the peak uh, the peaks of activity. So you have a major peak of activity usually around 5 a.m. Um, and it's quite clear, for example, here. And then you have other um, smaller peaks that can happen around um, 9 a.m. and around 11 a.m. Uh, 11 p.m. Sorry. Um, so and and we have a clear daily dynamic that is repeated that um, sometimes vary from day to day, but is uh, quite clearly um, repeated. So this is um, the the uh, the acoustic activity before the treatment. So then we looked at the the acoustic activity level. Um, we compared the, the acoustic activity level between uh, the different weeks and we found that there was a significant increase of activity with the treatment that um, didn't uh, go down with, uh, after, the, after the treatment. We also found um, that there was a significant delay in the acoustic activity, so the di diurnal um, patterns were shifted um, a bit later. Um, and we think that it's because the, the acoustic activity was increasing after the playback of the noise. So they, um, they, they shifted their peak um, a bit later due to the noise. Um, and this, this delay was not, um, it was not possible to explain it by photo period. So, um, so we, we think that it was clearly, it was uh, due to the noise. Um, so in summary, we have a simple and efficient um, method to quantify the activity of uh, a population. And so we think that it's possible for a similar, other similar species that are alone in their frequency band to, um, to undertake um, population monitoring with this method. Um, we found that this species has a periodic activity um, and, um, and so it's important to, to take into account the, the diurnal variation of activity when um, when de designing a monitoring scheme for uh, uh, using acoustics, um, and finally, we could detect changes in uh, in the activity in response to the noise. So it's possible to use acoustic monitoring to uh, monitor um, responses to environmental changes. So. Um, with those uh, two study cases, I hope that I showed you how uh, useful this method could be. Um, and we're still very early in the in the application of freshwater of um, acoustic monitoring in uh, freshwater. Um, and so there are um, things that we need to work on um, in order to make it a standardized method. So what we really want for, for this method is to be um, reliable, to know how reliable it is, and to know um, um, how and how widely it can be applied for freshwater environments. Um, and so uh, in recent uh, papers, we've uh, come up with six main challenges that we think we need to work on to to improve the, the, the possibility to apply um, freshwater monitoring. So the first one is to associate sounds to organisms and processes. So as I told you before, um, 271 species in France are uh, soniferous, um, and about only 35, only 35 percent of the sounds of those species have been described. So there is really a lot of work to do to catalog those sounds and to know to to be able to associate sounds and um, and species <clears throat> and 
as I told you before as well, for the for for plants, we are only discovering really um, that sounds uh, produce those sounds in uh, that plants produce those sounds in freshwater environments. So it's really important to um, it would be really important to develop um, the 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 knowledge and cataloging those sounds. Um, the second challenge is once you have uh, cataloged the sound, you don't necessarily know if it's um, species specific. So it's important to know how much interest specific variation there is, because if there is more interest specific variation than interspecific variation, then your two species won't be told apart. So the um, so indeed, it's important also to know which are the sources of variation. So at the level of individuals, um, there are various intra-individual sources, um, such as uh, temperature, for example. You have, with temperature, the, the rate of calling is, is, um, can, be, can change. <clears throat> you have also humidity and other, other factors. Um, there's also inter-individual sources of variation. So the classic one is the, um, the body mass. Um, so you have a negative relationship between uh, frequency and body mass where bigger individuals sing lower. Um, so all of these uh, sources of variation are very important to, um, to assess. And, and it's going to be very important to record several individuals per species in different environmental conditions um, to be able to know whether a signal is species specific or not. The third challenge that I've already talked about a bit is um, evaluating temporal variations. Um, because of course, if you set off to record one species and you end up recording only during the downtime of, of this species, um, it's not going to be very effective. So um, in most, um, when we know really well the species and its activity, it's easy to say I'm going to record, for example, for amphibians, I'm only recording between you know, midnight and 3 a.m. when my species is calling. Um, but for, but for species that we don't know so much about, um, it's nice, it's important to record for longer during the day uh, for, uh, to, to make sure to um, record the whole 24 hours. And it's also, there is the diurnal variation, but also the seasonal variation. So some species will uh, only call at very specific times during uh, during the year. So that's something to be um, studied as well. Um, model the sound propagation. So knowing how far your hydrophone can reach or how far the sound of an animal can reach and how um, to have an idea of the acoustic uh, space that your, or the ac active space of your hydrophone is very important um, because if you have very heterogeneous um, environments, you might need to sample at more than one location. Um, and so this is a graph showing the amplitude uh, in function of the distance and you have a clear attenuation of the signal. Um, and clearly around 14 meters, you, um, it was not possible to detect the fish grunts over the um, the the background noise. Um, so it would be interesting to have information about all the sound propagation to know uh, how to design uh, spatial uh, sampling in freshwater. Um, another aspect is linking ecological conditions to sounds. Um, and so that's a bit what I was uh, talking about with the communities and microinvertebrates. Um, so one thing that's interesting about uh, sound production is that, um, of course, some species don't produce sounds, um, or some species produce one sound, some produ species produce several sounds. So there is uh, no one-to-one -one relationship. And then if you look at this um, graph, um, 
uh, scheme, which is the uh, showing where um, the macroinvertebrates that are used for bioassessments. Um, these species are indicators of good quality waters, whereas the higher ones here uh, on uh, Corixidae, Coleoptera, and uh, um, the worms are indicators of bad quality waters. So <clears throat> within all of these macroinvertebrates, um, only the Trichoptera, the uh, Coleoptera and Corixidae are producing sound. And only one species of Odonata. So, um, and the most uh, soniferous species, the, the group that contains the most species that produce sounds are Corixidae. So, uh, so, so clearly, they're quite generalist. So it might be that uh, in environments that contain most sounds are environments that are um, that are the um, not in such good qualities, but uh, in such good quality. But um, but it would be interesting to. It's always interesting to look at uh, composition of the community rather than um, and just whether one group is present or absent. Um, and finally, the, the last challenge is to mutualize efforts across disciplines. Um, I think ecoacoustics, and especially in freshwater, um, is an extremely multidisciplinary um, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, field. So it would, it's in, very important to combine all these um, all this knowledge um, to be able to advance the, this um, this uh, science. And so we had a special issue just published in Freshwater Biology um, with 15 articles and uh, 49 contributors from all kinds of backgrounds. Um, so it was really interesting to bring them all together and. Um, and work um, on that. And we worked on that with Simon Link and Toby Gilford. And um, we also are, um, I'm um, more of a ecoacoustics. Uh, initially, Simon Link is more of a freshwater ecologist. And uh, Toby Gilford is more coming from a music acoustic background. So um, coming all together to do this special issue was, I guess, um, already um, kind of uh, a good step towards this uh, this mutualizing the the efforts. So yeah, thank you for um, your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, people can write in. I think it might be easier if I MC questions, so you're not bombarded and have to read at the same time, but. I'll start off with one. I thought I was very interested in your first study that you did with the BCA analysis. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, could you give a little bit of information about what parameters you included in your acoustics axis one and your macro invert axis two? Were, was it abundance? Was it sound level? Was it what, what parameters were you capturing in those axes? Yes, um, yeah, um, I was a little bit quick on that. So, um, <clears throat> so the, um, these axes represent the com community composition. So they were um, based really on uh, the, uh, so the matrix that we used was uh, presence, absence of uh, uh, sound types. Um, and absence of species specific sound types. Um, here we were we were using a method that's kind of the same as um, um, morpho species. So when you go to a tropical forest and you don't, most of the species are not described yet. You will use um, morpho species as a way to um, to have um, to say those are likely a group of species or a group of individuals that make up a species. So because we don't have, as I um, told you, you in my talk, we don't have much information yet about all the species specific sounds. Um, we were not able to, uh, to classify each sound um, 
as a specific species, but we were able to still, um, from my experience, we, we knew kind of the, the, dis, uh, the differences that, typi the typical differences between species. Um, so, so we classified those sound types as um, types of sounds or, um, that are likely to be one species. Okay, so your so your sound metrics were classified source categories. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And what was your um, what were the macro invert metrics? So the macro invertebrates uh, metrics was um, abundance of uh, of species. So gotcha. we, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from our room or from the audience? Oh, so there was a question here in the room on, can you describe how you came up with your noise source in your second set of studies that you played back? What was that? Yeah, so um, it was um, the, um, so it was a, an artificial uh, pond. And so the, the noise source was uh, the, um, the pump, uh, the broken pump of a, of a fountain. So it was, um, so we characterized the, the, um, the, the noise that it made, which was uh, quite wide band, as you could see probably in the, um, in the spectrogram. And um, because it was broken, it had been off for a long time. And so we, we took advantage of that to um, to put it on, and because it was broken, there was no flow of water, so it was just really making a loud noise. Um, but yeah, it could be. I guess it it could be considered similar to a, a kind of a pot noise. Um, I'm. I would expect that it's similar to, yeah. Um, you know, white band and um, quite loud. Any other questions? This was really neat. This was one of our first uh, freshwater biology acoustics seminars. So thank you so much for taking the time to do this with us. Um, thank you. And it's okay if we post this for people to use in their classes and so forth in, in the future? Of course, sure. Okay, it looks like there were 11 from URI. There's nine here. So it looks like we're about 30 to 40 people that were able to, to tune in today. So that's a good number. Good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, thank, you. thank you so much. All right, our next seminar is the March 10th, same time, same place. The Zoom information is online. And if anybody has any questions, feel, please feel free to reach out to us. Thanks so much, Camille. That was great. Thank you. Thank you.